Thank you, and welcome to this evening's uh, presentation and conversation with uh, Donna Karen. I'm delighted to welcome you all here, and I'm particularly delighted to, to welcome Parsons alumna and Board of Governor member Donna Karen to the New School on the occasion of the launch of the new fashion graduate programs at Parsons. I'm also very pleased to welcome Valerie Steele, the Director and Chief Curator of the Museum at FIT. It's a great moment to see each other as colleagues and collaborators and our institutions as complements to each other. We're often only seen as competitors. The appearance of, by Donna Karen this evening is a christening of the MFA program in fashion design and society that she was so instrumental in helping us create. This truly innovative program will enable a select group of talented designers to develop their creative abilities and to consider fashion deeply and broadly in its cultural and social context. Thanks to Donna's vision and enthusiasm for this program, others have also come forward to support it, including Diane von Furstenberg, a longtime supporter of Parsons and the fashion industry, who is funding a scholarship. In addition, this fall, Parsons is launching a master's in fashion studies to further research in this field through the critical analysis of fashion and its scholarship. These programs, the first fashion graduate degrees in Parsons history, are part of a larger effort at Parsons to create new types of graduate programs that take advantage not only of Parsons' reputation as a global leader in design education, but also the diverse, diverse range of disciplines and areas of study at the New School, from social sciences to media studies, global studies, environmental and urban design and studies and beyond. I know that uh, much of tonight's conversation is actually going to touch on the social and political implications of fashion and its place in the world. I would like now to introduce Shelley Fox, the Donna Karen Professor of Fashion Design at Parsons and the Director of the MFA in Fashion Design and Society. Having spent personally many hours in London and New York talking to Shelley about this opportunity, trying to talk her into this opportunity, helping her to get settled in New York and now seeing the launch of this MFA after two or three years of experience of travel, I'm uh, very personally satisfied also with the whole arc of this, uh, this journey. So Shelley herself is not only an innovative and experimental designer, his work has been exhibited internationally, including the recent Gothic Dark Glamour exhibition at the museum at FIT, but she's also a cutting edge researcher and educator. We're very excited to have her lead this new program and I'd like to welcome her to the podium to introduce th this evening's proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. As Tim mentioned, we are delighted to have Donna Karen and Valerie Steele with us this evening on such an exciting occasion to launch the new fashion graduate programs at Parsons. It's hard to believe that it's been two years since I've been in New York, first appointed the Donna Karen Professor of Fashion Design at Parsons in charge of developing the new MFA, Fashion Design and Society, which is very important to note. Since that time, I've been on a very exciting journey meeting with industry leaders around the world, as well as talented faculty and prospective students to create a truly innovative program that I think these young designers with access to new technologies and new ways of thinking about fashion, as well as the ability to build industry connections that they simply would not be possible for a young designer working on their own. All of this could not be possible without the support of Parsons alumni Donna Karen. Her vision truly has helped shape the programme and we look forward to continuing to keep her engaged and once the programme launches this fall. Tonight Donna will speak about her life and career and we are grateful to have Valerie Steele join us in this conversation. Valerie is the Director and Chief Curator at the Museum of Fashion Institute of Technology here in New York. She's created more than 20 exhibitions and of course authored many important books. And of course Donna needs no introduction. Just for the audience, I'd like to say there's a Q&A at the end of the conversation and that cards will be collected at the end of the aisles by the staff here around 6.30 p.m. So if you could hand those forward, then we can open up the Q&A to the panel. The event will be filmed and made available on YouTube within a few days. I would like now to hand over the stage to Valerie and Donna and I hope that will be a truly interesting and stimulating, important conversation for this evening. Thank you. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, Shelley is the Donna Karen Professor of Fashion. It's kind of amazing, actually. Um, uh, I dropped out of high school and later went back to school. And you dropped out of Parsons. 
And so I wonder, it's kind of unusual for uh, people who drop out of school to then become so really committed. What do you think is, is different now that students need this kind of advanced study? You know, uh, when I was at Parsons, I think I'm echoing, is it hard? Is, is that cool? Okay. Yeah. Hi there. You know, when I was at Parsons, I don't think I was ready to be at Parsons. And I think it's, you know, one of the passions that I have that I think people need to be ready to really go to school. I don't think I was ready to go to high school either. Um, <laughs> I certainly didn't wait to get out. <laughs> that, that, that was kind of hard too. You know, but I knew there was a, a, a passion for fashion, so to speak, or a passion for art. You know, I was most comfortable in the art room. Um, and I almost didn't graduate high school. But then when I got into Parsons, um, I was sort of a wild card, so to speak. And, you know, when you're on your own path, uh, I never remember, I was always remember being told, well, you'll never make it as a designer. But before being a designer, I actually wanted to be a fashion illustrator. And uh, I went to Women's Wear Daily for a job. And they said, well, I don't think you should take up fashion <laughs> illustration. So there I was, not knowing what to do. I just felt unwanted, if that would be the case. But what I realized uh, when I was offered a job at Ann Klein in my second year of school at Parsons, and she said, basically, why do you have to go back to school? You're going to learn it all here. And I said, I wasn't, I was so in awe of being on 7th Avenue, you know, that I really didn't understand the implications of what a gift it is to be in school. And truly, that opportunity of knowledge and time to really find your own essence, yeah. to find out and to explore your own abilities, you know, and give yourself that opportunity. So uh, it's a, a blessing and a curse. Yeah. I think we all live in that world today. And uh, I celebrate Parsons and continue to celebrate Parsons and FIT as an educational system that um, is just extraordinary and gives us the opportunity to find out who we are, what we are all about, and gives us the tools to embark upon the journey that we go on to as, as fashion designers. Well, it's called Fashion Design and Society. And I wonder, what, what role do you think society has in the work of a fashion designer? Well, for me, it's very personal. You know, society is probably more important than the fashion, you know, as a woman, for a woman, designing for women, you know, I'm faced every day with looking at that mirror. You know, and saying, okay, I don't think any of us look in and say, that's the perfect picture. You know, we always want to change it. I'm to this, I'm to that, I'm to this, I'm to that. And, you know, I couldn't seem to find that which I was comfortable in. And I felt that um, what type of system you know, how was I addressing myself? How was I dressing myself? It was, it was always this kind of struggle of, of looking for pieces that I wanted. And I really wanted to design a collection for me and my friends, because it was very personal. I mean, it really was. I'm sorry to say, the seven easy pieces, I get up every morning, put on my bodysuit, you know, put on my leggings, start yoga, and then got to wear something, dress it up, dress it down, have no time to worry about changing clothes. So I needed clothes that are flexible, movable, you know, not wanting to think of, oh, do I have time to wear that dress or that dress or that dress? I just needed a concise wardrobe. And I found that there were a lot of women like myself who were constantly on the go, constantly traveling, you know, um, it's like when you go off to Europe or wherever you're going, you know, you pack a bag and you say, what are the essential pieces that I need? You know, what's going to take me to work, take me out, take me, you know, to hang out. You know, if it's cold, if it's hot, you know, whatever the weather conditions are, you know, cover up what I want to cover up, show what I want to show. You know, the pieces that I really love more than anything else. And I needed some pieces. Yeah. <laughs> I needed some pieces of clothes. So it was very personable. And then when I found out that uh, there were a few people like me, yeah. which was me and my friends, then I didn't realize that my friends were my daughter, my daughter's friends, and a few <laughs> other friends. And everybody was sort of in the closet picking up all these clothes. So from there, 
launch. I couldn't have everybody walking around of us looking alike in a uniform, as much as I love uniforms. Yeah. I really do love uniforms of dressing. Um, that launched DKNY. Yeah. So kind of. A so it's a very personal. Generation. It's a very personal journey for me of what um, clothes represents. It's not only what you're wearing on the outside, but how you're emotionally feeling on the inside. Well, if you look at the pictures from oh the God. early okay. uh, seven easy pieces, it's there's so. Can I borrow those so I can put them down the runway next week? <laughs> <laughs> they really work even now. Um, they sure do. And they're really different than the kind of clothes that women were wearing for work before then. I mean, it strikes me that they combine practicality with a tremendous kind of glamour. Well, you know, it all starts with the body. You know, we are a body, both inside and outside. You know, for me, it's how do you contain your body? It's sort of the new foundation, so mm -hmm. to speak. You know, and how do you take this element of black that I think is a uniform of color. You don't have to think about it. I don't have to think, I love that. And what can I accent it with? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the bodysuit, the pair of pants, camel classic coat, you know, take a piece of sequence, wrap it all on top, and you can basically wear the same body yeah. on a continual level. So I felt that it could look like a dress, and it could look like a jumpsuit, and it could look like the underpinning for a suit. So it really is, so the bodysuit, the skirt, the pan, the jacket, the coat, that wonderful piece that, I, my God, I can't live without, you know. It amazes me today how sequence is still selling. Yeah. You know, cashmere sequence. People and, like that And the cozies and, you know, things like that. I, I think when I'm designing, I hope that I'm creating pieces that have longevity. Yeah. That they're not pieces, you know, maybe the shoulders get a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, and the hemlines go up and down, but I guarantee you they, come up and they go down and they go up and they go down <laughs> you know it's like um and it's it's classic it's like a man's wardrobe but for the sensuality and exactly. the power of a woman yeah because for me i think women need to be celebrated you know and to celebrate that sensuality that we carry that power that we carry that energy that we carry and it's never about the clothes. For me, it's more about the person. Right. You know, and how, how they're relating to both their insides and their outsides. Well, I think probably that's central to your whole success, that you're relating not just to clothes, but to the other woman, the client, her body, her mind. You know, I find that my inspiration is not dressing her on the outside, but dressing her on the inside. You know, and the more I explored my own personal journey and sharing that with so many other you know people that I find when I go in the dressing room where you have that intimate moment nine chances out of ten you don't talk about clothes you talk about what's going on in their life you know how are they uh, dealing with their craziness their chaos you know how the hairdresser knows everything yes. Well, the designer is fortunate to go into a dressing room and really become an intimate language with the consumer. Yeah. And for me today, um, mind, body, and spirit, it's all together. You know, it's what we put inside of our body, what we eat, the health that we live, you know, the exercise that we take, the foods that we eat, our relationships to people, what's happening in life today. And we're all sitting here with a catastrophe you know, now that we're all faced with what's happened in Haiti, you know, and um, it's hard to think that life is the way it was. It's different. You know, we're in a society today that conscious consumerism and us as people are so in targeted and sensitive to the world around us. So what fashion is right now, to me, is social consciousness. Yeah you know, and the importance of fashion today. You know, I've gone on many journeys of being <coughs> inspired by the cultures around us in the world today. You know, as, as a creative entity, you, you travel a lot and you're inspired by India and Africa and, you know, and Bali. And that for me, you know, it's where my heart goes out. You know, just, I love it. I love the uniforms they wear. <laughs> I love uniforms. I mean, really do. You know, I went to Tibet once, or I was in, um, where is it? I forgot. Bhutan. In Bhutan. How do you remember that? Thank you. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's so cool. They wear the same thing every day, and they look how good they look. 
Then we come Good back colors, and I go, oh, too. that red that, was perfect, red, yeah. that white. <laughs> it was perfect. And I said, why do we have to go into a closet and figure it out? They look so good every day. You know, put on a kimono, wrap it around, you know, and it lasts forever. And then we go into all these changes of clothes. But it was definitely an inspiration, and it always has been. So culture has always been an inspiration for me. And when I think about how people live, their pure essence of where they're coming from, where the spirit, where their inspiration is, yeah. where their soul is, I think when you're designing, you're not designing just from an eye level. You're designing from inside, you it's know, and connecting on that level. At the same time, you have come up with some of the most brilliant images, talking about eyes, that any fashion designer in America has. I mean, the advertising, these women with the baby, seem to me to be so incredibly intense and speak on so many levels. First of all, how did you come up with this, this um, ad campaign? Well, that's me and my daughter. Um, <laughs> I, you know, so. I, I don't want to say this is all about me, but you know when you when you're trying to work and be a mother and try to live that complicated life of wife, mother, lover, boyfriend, you know, and all the things and what am I eating and how am I being and what it comes out, you know. I mean, we are expressing, you know, that which we feel, and I know that you know I'm going to work and I have a baby there, and unfortunately. You know, I, I live in a birth-death type of experience. I don't think I would be sitting here today without experiencing birth and death, and that was the death of Anne Klein. Um, when I went to work for her, and I was sure I was never going to be a designer. I wanted to be home and be a mom. Well, I guess that's not what the universe offered me. Um, my boss was sick with cancer, and uh, I was eight, nine months pregnant, ready to tell Anne that, you know, I'm taking a hiatus for about 20 years um, to raise my child because I didn't want to be a working woman like my mother. And I guess that didn't work out that way. And I got, um, and in those days, people did not discuss cancer. It was a non-discussed situation. And Anne had cancer at the time, and I was pregnant, and a collection was due. So living in birth and death simultaneously at the same time, um, I was in the hospital, and Anne was in the hospital, and we had a collection due the next day. And I get a call from the office and said, Vildana, when are you coming back to work? And I said, well, would you like to know whether I had a boy or a girl? <laughs> Thank God I was nine days late. <laughs> there I am, very pregnant in the office. And uh, unfortunately, Anne was in the hospital, a collection was due, and I was due, and a collection was due. And I gave birth, and the collection was due the next day. And I said, well, I can't go back to work. They said, well, why don't we, we'll come to you. I said to the doctor, well, um, what do I do? <laughs> he says, well, you have to stay home for at least, you know, kind of a week. And everybody brought the company out to my home, my new home. And I figured, great, you're all going to come see my new baby. <laughs> and all of a sudden, um, a phone call came in that Ann just passed away. And I got to the point, I said, okay, it's amazing what we plan in the universe, yeah, you know, so what our plans nice. are, forget it. If anybody has any plans, drop them, because it's not <laughs> the way it is. You know, you just got to be able to be in the moment, living in the moment, be prepared for anything at any time of your life. And I think that's, you know, these lessons we learn as we grow. So um, being in that duality of mother, and businesswoman and trying to juggle it all together and it's 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 not as odd today i came from a working mother and it was very difficult for me as a child i think today you know it's more understandable the man and the female role but i mean you can see now how with these ads too the personal the is the political it was yeah. all you the baby there's the baby working in the middle of the bed but it's obviously something that millions of other women experience and identify with. Look that way. And then, of course. And then the super Hillary. Famous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. This, now, this is a perfect example of fashion design and society. I think the, the name of the program fits so perfectly with this that 
again, where did this idea come from? Well, we were designing pinstripe suits, and I had this vision of exactly what the ad campaign would be, and she was sort of standing over the table, I forgot the name of the movie, and she was talking to her board of directors and getting really kind of like, this is the way I want it. And I said, hmm, I could see it, a woman running for president. So I called Peter Arnell, and I, it was the, I think it was the night before our shoot, so he was so conditioned to whatever would come into my mind, God bless him. Uh, I said to Peter, Peter, what do you think of about a woman running for president? I said, I know we can do it. You know, I know you can do it. He says, great idea, Donna. Hmm. And he took Rosemary. And, and for me, the reason I chose Rosemary as an icon, it wasn't about fashion models. For me, it was about the soul of the woman. And, and to know Rosemary and Rosemary's body was not your typical body, you know. Developed, she had great legs great head, but the in-between part wasn't exactly your typical fashion model who was walking down the runway. And she just exuded to me reality. Yeah. And being able to be empowered as a woman and being able to stand along next to a man, you know, to me it's not either or, it's and. Yeah. You know, I celebrate men in the same way that I celebrate women. You know, it's a partnership. Yeah but to elevate women for their ability to have vision and uh, creativity and strength and to be able to mother. We're going through a feminine period right now, you know, where I think we've been living in a masculine world of, you know, I have what has just happened to our masculine world. It got crashed. And now it's the birth of the feminine. It's the birth of the mothering and the caring and all those aspects and guides and to look at that feminine energy and how can we care for our society today. And I think that's what propels me as a designer today. It's not just looking at um, wearing what's on the outside, but truly the essence of what life is all about. And I think fashion as a, a fashion designer, you know, our social responsibility is probably bigger now than ever before. Can you talk a little bit about your philanthropic endeavors, sure. and particularly the, the Urban hated, Zen? Yeah, Urban Zen. You know, there was Donna Karen that was birthed, and then there was DKNY, and how that evolved. And then I found within the chaos, where was the calm? And I was always philanthropically driven. When the AIDS epidemic uh, broke out, I felt that we have to galvanize a community to how do we take fashion and um, to make a, a, a real difference in the AIDS epidemic, which started fa uh, Seventh on Sale. And that was probably one of the highlights of my life. I mean, really, really, when you galvanize a whole community together, you get the consumer involved, you get the retailers involved, you get the designers involved, no ego attached, AIDS. Yeah. <laughs> we raised $4 million in three days, and it was just probably the most brilliant yeah. experience. I, I just was passionate about it. And then from that came um, Elizabeth Glazer's uh, Fund for uh, Kids with AIDS, Kids for Kids. And again, bringing communities together, the music industry, the fashion industry, and all that, and the families, you know, how to bring that all together. And which birthed yet another event, which was uh, Super Saturday, which happens out in the Hamptons, again, when all the designers get together and all consciousness comes to how do you dress and address issues in hand. And I looked at the bigger picture and I really felt there is such a strong need for um, commerce and philanthropy to join together. And my passion, about 10 years ago, I started an organization called Urban Zen. How do you find the calm and the chaos? where a new model of business would be created where you take philanthropy and commerce and join it together to really galvanize how to communicate to the consumer. And it gave me a, a small platform where I was able to design a group of clothes that was not about a season, was not about a runway, <laughs> was a little experiment that um, it was not only about clothes. I was journeying all around the world and I've been very involved in Bali and Africa and India and really my journey on a creative source and had a, a little home 
where I can bridge philanthropy and commerce together. My husband, unfortunately, at that time um, had passed away from cancer. And what I realized, what I wanted to say is, how do I take all my inspirations of culture, of present, which was healthcare, which I was very, very involved in, and the future, which was education, and join it together and created a center called Urban Zen, which is in my husband's studio. So we're a ph philanthropic driven organization that brings like-minded people together who want to make a change uh, by pre preserving the culture, by dealing with healthcare, which for me is a major initiative that I've taken on that each one of us are patients yeah. and each one of us are a loved one and nobody gets away with this. So instead of looking at per disease, there was a missing element in the medical system today, is who was caring for the patient and who was caring for the loved one. Right. So I launched the Urban Zen Integrative Therapist, and very much like a community like this, we got together in what is called the Urban Zen Center. We had a 10-day event on well-being. We brought the leaders of medicine together and said, okay, what can we do to help um, look at, again, a missing link? Because what each of us need to do out there is look at what's missing, you know, and find that link to find how can you make a difference in this world, whether it be in fashion or art or communication. There's so much of it out there, but what is that little piece that's not being what's addressed? Missing? And that's the birth of Urban Zen. And DKMY, of yes. course. Yes. <laughs> well, Tell me, uh, this is such a great story. The audience should hear how you thought of DKNY. Well, Donna Karen didn't seem like a strong enough name. And I was sitting in a, when Donna Karen had started, I was sitting in my, uh, my I don't know what you'd call it, my kitchen. That's where I sort of started, <laughs> Donna Karen. And there was a shoebox on the table that said, Maud Vizan, Paris, and London. So I said, hmm, what about Donna Karen, New York? That would say who I was. You know, I didn't have to think about, you know, how do you explain who Donna Karen is? I figured you put the name New York and it would explain it. So while I was catering to that New York woman, and to me, New York mm -hmm. meant, you know, the world. Right. You know, it is the focal point of everything. It's the most international city. It bridges east from west, you know, from the United States to London. New York, sort of like the center of everything for me. Um, maybe before China, but you know, maybe I'll have to come up with it. I think that's where Urban Zen comes in, but we'll go there. <laughs> um, so, Donna Karen, New York, I needed New York as a grounding for what I wanted to say, because I never wanted it to be about my name as much as an inspiration. And as my daughter was wearing all my clothes and all her friends were wearing the clothes and I realized that I needed a more casual life wardrobe, and whereas Donna Karen was about an executive woman who was constantly on the go, constantly traveling, constantly doing that, there was the street life. You know, my daughter, my friends, my family, you know, a much larger existence. The city, the streets, and being outside of the city. And that came DKMY, which celebrated the streets of New York. Well, you've been so associated with New York fashion for your whole life. I mean, your father, your stepfather, your mother, all of them were in fashion. And sort of you're seen as the quintessential New Yorker queen of 7th Avenue. How do you think New York fashion has changed? And where do you think it's going? That's a good question. Uh, where I would like to see it go? Yeah. I think we're on the cusp of something so major. I really think conscious consumerism was where it's at. There's not even a question in my mind. I don't think we can look at fashion through the old model any longer. I think we have to be conscious. I think we have to be aware of what is design all about. What is our purpose and what is our reason? Um, I will never forget it September 11th when that hit. And it was the day of the fashion show. Yeah. Okay, we were doing our DKNY show and September 11th hit. And Patty called me up that morning. And interestingly enough, it was also the first year that first collection I was going to show with my husband not being here. And we were showing in the armory. And we were also showing in the tents. And you said at that point, you know, somebody woke up 
me up and said, life will never be the same. And I peered out my window. I was living downtown at the time, watching the buildings and then watching the TV. And life was never the same. You know, at least in our generation that we've experienced. We've heard about it. We've seen it. We've been exposed to it. But I don't think life will ever be the same. And I think there's a world consciousness that has awoken us all to what does it mean to be conscious. You know, and how that hit and how it hit us all. And I thought about it. My daughter said to me, again, back to my daughter. It's always about my daughter. Gabby should be sitting here right now. But and my other children, my seven grandchildren. But, you know, mommy, mommy, what do we do? And I said, I've got all these sample hands sitting downtown on 7th Avenue. And I have to worry about them and their lives and their children and everything else. So when I say the consciousness, you know, it's not just joining a philanthropic organization. Philanthropy for me is being conscious of the person next to you right. and what their life is about and what they're going through and galvanizing a community and realizing the importance of what business really is. And it's a business. Well, and that, touching people on every single level. So building a community, building a purpose, building a reason, building a voice, understanding a person's life that is not just in the material world of what they're wearing on the outside, but what they're dealing with on their inside as well. So um, for me, this industry particularly is probably more relevant than ever before. You know, we're going through an echo change. You know, we have to be conscious of our environment. What are our fabrics? How do we help emerging countries? How do we help the emerging New York City? Mm. I mean. I used to remember when we had manufacturing here, we had fabrics here, we had everything here. How do we build the creativity up that we're not just and looking outside and the craftsmanship and the artistry and the opportunity here? I mean, I am looking so desperately for that creativity yeah. to be next door to me that I don't have to feel that I have to get on a plane to go somewhere else. Yeah. Not that I don't want to support an international community. But the opportunity of our own community of what it can create is astonishing yeah. and help the other cities around our own country. Yeah. And once again, it's, it's mobilizing, creating, you know, I'm, I'm launching a major campaign for Haiti. Um, not only am I part of the CFDA in a t-shirt that we're launching for help, 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 health, heal Haiti. But it's also uh, an event that I'm, I'm starting and launching on Monday where um, it's help uh, he, a tent for today, a home for tomorrow. So we'd be putting up tents where for $1,000 you can buy a tent to help somebody. My goal and dream is to build a community in Haiti where it can become a sustainable model, you know, where we can help the creativity, support the creativity, and involve ourselves in people who need our, ha our hand. You know, giving them a home, a tent to live in today, right. a home tomorrow, an educational system, a manufacturing system. And what an opportunity it, here, it is here, right here, for us to support and rebuild a devastation that is just three hours away. Right. You know, and the culture of the people of Haiti that are so much a part of our essence here. Yeah. So it's, it's uniting as a front. Well, it's, uh, it's in a way related to what Shelley said once, uh, that it wasn't just about how you made clothes or what clothes you made, but why you made clothes, why you're doing things. The intention. What is the soul? What is the spirit? How do we want to touch another human being? How do we want to communicate that? You know, and I, th I think the frivolity and all the hype that we've seen for the years, I think we're moving into a much larger realm of what it means to make a garment. And that goes back to when I think of the soul of the garment, of the wisdom of what goes into the garment. What are we saying when we're creating? I think there's so many more messages to be put out there than just, this is the hot new item right. of the season. You know, there has to be consciousness within the clothing. And something that people want to wear, something that makes them feel good. You feel good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Well, I remember how sensual Ooh. sensuality and the, sort of this woman's body is such a big part of your work and feeling good about your body. Well, to me, yes, who's a dear friend of mine, and it's always been for me about a relationship, the relationship with people, and uh, 
This fabric was celebrating an artistic expression that I met with another artist from London. And uh, inspir inspirational, he's a teacher also at, um, what is this school in London? Help London me. College of Fashion, uh, Central St. Martins. San Ma yes, Central St. Martins. And how the fabric moved on the body, you know, it talked. You know, I don't believe that I think it expresses itself through the hand, through the body, through the language of the communication between the body and a piece of fabric. It talks. Yeah. So. Now this was another story, this advertising campaign set in Vietnam. Mm. Incredibly romantic and evocative. I wonder, this kind of that's for the bedding. storytelling, <laughs> that's for the bedding, well. <laughs> you know, you got to get into bed all the time also. And then your menswear. Uh, how, how do you think? I had a question him. Oh, you know, it's yeah. very simple where I get him into doing things. <laughs> you know, if you, you know, you want to connect with people, no. Um, how, so you hire him for your ad campaign so you can meet him? <laughs> sort of, no. Um, uh, doing menswear was really a fascinating story yeah. of how I got into the menswear business. My husband was, uh, I was a pure Armani fan. You know, and a guy comes to me one day and he says, uh, I want to do men's collection with you. And I said, but I'm a woman. Why would I do men's clothes? Yeah. And my husband wears Armani and I'm very happy with it. So it makes absolutely no sense to me. And he says, well, I want you to meet this guy who makes custom-made men's suits. And he walks into my office and it sort of blew me away. My father passed away when I was three years old, made custom-made suits for men. So I'm going, dee, 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 dee. you know, got to read the signs. And when I opened um, a retail store out in Long Island where I lived when I was 18 years old, I was opening a men's clothing store with my, with my husband. And, these, and the clothes didn't appear. So out of the box of clothes came all these suits, and under one suit was a hanger from my father, my father's custom-made suits that was down in Brooklyn. He passed away when I was three years old. So if anybody wants to know what took me on a woo-woo trip, that was you know, sort of when you start to wake up and read you know, what you're being told, I was led into the menswear business. I guess I was born in menswear. Yeah. You know, so I said, I guess I had to do men. I love men. I, they, I could not be who I am today. It wasn't for the knowledge that my father put through me. So in celebration of my father, I did a men's collection and also to dress my husband. Yep. And I said, if I can't make a difference in menswear, and I took the same seven easy pieces for men, which was the inspiration for women, to be bluntly yeah. honest. Um, and I just love men. Now, I have only one more question before I'm going to ask Shelley to come up here and take questions from the audience. But You've been talking very urgently lately about how we have to get the whole schedule of fashion rearranged and stop having fashion shows uh, and pr bringing clothes into the stores at times that are wildly divergent from when we're buying and wearing the clothes. Can you talk about that a little, particularly about how, the, how we're going to do that, turning around this huge machine, which it's is... It's very simple. We just stop. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not nuclear science, it's really simple. We deliver fall clothes in August, like back to school, and we change the calendar. We go to the stores and we say, okay, no more getting, you know, fall clothes in July or June, so it gets on sale in September when the weather hasn't changed. You know, we have to go into an eco-friendly system where we're talking in season. It's the way we eat. It's the way we dress, it's the way we think, because what we've conditioned the consumer to buy is on sale. Yeah. You know, I don't want to buy at regular price because I can buy it on sale. So unless we change the system, it's not going to happen. You know, we're going to be conditioned. We, we've turned our business into the white sale business. Right. When I launched my company, the shows were in April and May. Now they're in February, so my question to this industry, and I say to myself and my own company, is why am I showing clothes in February? I don't want the consumer to see next week what is going to be in the stores for next fall, because it's confusing. 
what I want the consumer to see online, because this whole online communication, everything is what's here, what's here, what's here. Now, we have to deliver the messaging now We're in the movie industry. The consumer doesn't know about the movies until it's ready to come out. Well, why do we give the consumer so much information about fashion, you know, six and seven months before time? It makes no sense to me. So you'd stop fashion shows? No, I or shifted. Them I, later. Would, I would shift the fashion shows. What I'm trying to say is, yes, we need fashion shows, we need delivery time, but yeah. that's industry. Yeah. It is not for the general public. So the world of communication has to go, stop. It doesn't go out on the, on the wire. It doesn't go out on the, on the internet. It doesn't get out for the manufacturers to copy the designs that's taken a year to develop. I mean, we're killing our own industry. You know, nobody's interested in fashion in time. We're, we're, we're confusing the customer. There's too much information going out there. So we have to learn the word restriction. We have to come back. So this is an industry movement. This is, you know, yes, I could start it, I could talk about it, and I should be able to put my step where I believe it, but um, it's how I feel. I think a lot of people agree with you. Shelly, where's Miss Shelly? Is she coming up? There. Thank you. Now she's been getting questions for you from the audience. Thank you, Donna. Is this working okay? Thank you, Donna and Valerie. It's been uh, really, really interesting. Thank you. I think some of the things that you've just been talking about are really interesting because I think it's always that kind of, um, um, not always self-reflection, but industry reflection and the kind of you know system that we're working in and trying to challenge that. And it's really nice to hear you in this way to, to be questioning that. And some of the questions that I've been having, I'm having to pull some out because Donna's co covered some of these things in a really more interesting way. Other than when will Donna go green, I think th just the system, it's not really about going green and going organic in my opinion, just for the sake of it. It's more about analyzing the system that we're actually in. And I think what you're saying about shifting and the sales and the way that we consume is the thing that needs to be challenged. But I think um, um, many questions here, so I'm going to try and pull out the ones that I think are relevant. So, um, Donna, these are the questions from the audience. So, if you were a fashion professor at Parsons, what would you advise your students about the shrinking job market in the US or in the industry, full stop? I don't think the market's shrinking. I think it's shrinking, it's changing. So, I think there's a shift in what one would say is a fashion designer's approach to fashion. I think it's more holistic. I think to go to design right now, it's just not making a dress. You know, the old system is, let's create a dress, let's put it down the runway, and that's the end of it. I think it's far more complicated right now. I think we have to be open to exposed to many different cultures. I think we have to be exposed to many different ways of designing. Um, I think we have to be really creative to be sensitive to it's just not good enough to just think we're creative, we can come up with a garment. It has to have reason and purpose. And I must tell you today, I am always, I, it amazes me when I hire somebody or I, or I align with somebody and I engage with somebody as a designer today, it's a relationship that I, I would never live without. You know, it, it's wonderful to mentor people. I, I, I celebrate design. You know, and I think design is in computer technology right now, is in fabrication, it's developing the next. I am dying to find out, you know, what is the next dimension. You know, when stretch came on the market, you know, technology came on the market, where are we going after, you know, to me, fabric talks. You know, designing fabric and putting the artistry into fabric and to putting the artistry into jewelry, into shoes, into to having, you know, things that make a difference. You know, it's time. I mean, who would ever known that we would be all sitting around texting each other, you know, 10 years from now? So, uh, 10 years ago. What we're going to be doing in the next five years, I can't tell you. But that's for the designers to come up and tell us, you know, let's create. 
I think it's a celebration of creativity probably now more than ever, ever before. The old system is the old system. We're about to embark on the new system. The more knowledge, the more technical you are, the more creative you are, the more in touch you are, you will succeed. Which brings me on to probably a question that might lead well into that, but what inspired you to really support the MFA program at Parsons? As a designer looking for designers, you know, I found myself respectfully speaking looking for advanced schooling in students right now. And I needed designers to think to the next level. And I didn't feel that the three-year program was just not enough. You know, I wanted to look to a higher level. And that's where I was working with a lot of the schools in London. And I said, you know, how could I not then support the schools here in New York? That's a really interesting. And it just reminds me of something we spoke about, Donna, some time ago when we were, um, we were just talking about design. And um, you said to me, you, you, were just, you were busy and you had other, your mind elsewhere, but you said, um, when are they going to do something about those hospital gowns? And for me, mm. instantly, as, yeah. a, as a design tutor, I just thought it was such a great question. Um, question. I said, could I have that project? Yes, you have. Yeah. I have it. Please, and, um, I, I beg think, of you to design I, the next and hospital And I think gown. it comes back to that idea of fashion, society, and the fact that we are we, we, family, birth, death, so on, that we all, you know, we all will be having to use in that kind of digni undignified manner in the way they're design so I was just saying about how research is important to students in the sense that how would they research that they would have to talk to people so I think it's connecting again um, I there, you know we, we walk around with collars and arm braces and things like that. there's so many technical things I, I, I have to just tell this one mm. story is wonderful I used to work around with a neck brace all the time and I used to, to cut off my hosiery and put my neck brace in there and, you know, kind of put it around so nobody would know that I was really wearing a neck brace because they never came in chic black colors and it really was driving me crazy. So a woman came over to me at Bergdorf's one day and um, I was selling jewelry or accessories and everything like that. And I said, this is a beautiful pin or something like that. And she says, I can't wear it. I said, why can't you wear it? She said, I said, what's wrong with your neck? And she go, takes me in her pocketbook and she pulls out her neck brace. I said, oh, don't worry about that. I go to the hosiery counter. I get a uh, hosiery. <laughs> I cut the hosiery off. I stick her neck brace in the hosiery. And I said, here, now you can walk around with your neck brace and feel you're in the most divine new collar. So, it, you know, it's these pieces that can be thought about of what we can do. Um, I hope I can read this properly. As global spiritual awakening becomes widely accepted by everyone, how do you feel that coming into spiritual consciousness as a society of all women will affect the fashion industry? I, consciousness is being aware of somebody from their outside and their inside and being able to be in touch with not only the blessings that you've been gifted with, which is the blessing of creativity, you know, that creativity is probably what I think one of the highest blessings that one could have. You know, that's an energy that comes through you. You know, you're not just, you know, it's not something you think about. It's not something you learn. You don't need reading, writing. You don't learn creativity. That's, that's something you channel. And that's a gift. And through that gift is understanding the gift of connecting to another human being. So in being able to see the empty void to see the space to be able to connect with the person and see what the needs are you know that truly will elevate us to the world of design um, another question what do you find the most integral part of beginning and on running a successful business i think you need concept you know it's not just to be a designer that's not going to work. You need something far beyond it. There's a reason, a need, a purpose, and a philosophy. You know, look at what's missing. You know, what is that piece of the equation that you feel that you could attach to? And it only comes from one place. It's your gut. It, it, this is not your intellect. It's not a brainy thing. It comes from deep inside of you. What you can't live without. You can't be without. 
understanding what inspires you on a minute-to-minute -minute level because it's not just designing a season. It's not just looking in a magazine and being inspired. It's really connecting to your community, you know, connecting to what is needed and wanted, what is missing, what is that piece that you can add that is just the missing link. You know, when I came in as design, um, the fashion was going into a very masculine level. Women working around looking like men. You know, it was the bow ties, the, sh the shirts, the suits. Women were dressing more like men. And I said, well, it's kind of weird. Or they were dressing like Barbie dolls. And I said, what's in between a Barbie doll and a man? <laughs> you know, it was like, there had to be something else. And, uh, you know, when I, I just got into the true essence of finding, you know, who is the Martha Graham of today? <laughs> this is a, a personal one, and I think you might know them. I don't know. Do you have any regrets, Donna? Hello from the family at John's Coffee Shop in Cedarhurst. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have any regrets? Regrets, yeah. Do you have any regrets? You know, I think the one challenge that I will take till the day that I pass probably is not spending enough time with my family, you know, and, and really being in that yin and yang pull of mother and businesswoman, you know, and, and realizing should I be here or should I be there, you know, and realizing I think my correction of coming from a working mother, you know, and I hopefully at some point in my life that I could clear that one up. <laughs> but your daughter turned out so well. I don't think you I know what you teach at all. It's, it's, <laughs> pardon the expression, it's a Jewish guilt thing. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> you know, that's something, you know, I'm, I'm still working on. That's probably what took me on the path. But um, it, it's really hard to decide when that call comes in and says, Mommy. You know, when you get that mommy call, there's, there's nothing like that, or your granddaughter is calling, or your grandson is calling, or that family is calling, and you have that duality of being pulled in both directions. Like right now, Haiti called. I mean, it called me. It like hit me over the head with a hammer. And I have a collection due. So I'm sitting there going, you know, I've got to do this work for Haiti, and I have a collection due. You know, and I have my family. It's like that finding that balance, I think, is going to be, yeah. you know, my lesson in life. I know you touched on it, Valerie, earlier on, but, um, and Donna was saying that she um, kind of flunked out of Parsons. But what was one of the most important things you took away from your Parsons education? What is the most important thing I took away? I think that I failed draping and I had to go to summer school. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good line. <laughs> I mean, I failed draping. There are two things I failed in life. I failed typing. I mean, if I, in grade school, I failed typing. And at Parsons, I failed draping. <laughs> Got to show them up. <laughs> So I had a drape, 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 drape. <laughs> in a fashion world where everything seems done, looking at past and present, how would you suggest designers bring newness innovation to fashion or industry? I think almost what I've taken as my trademark for Urban Zen is past, present, and future. I think we have to be inspired by the past. I think we have to live in the present, and we have to look to the future. And you know, mobilizing all those three areas. Learn from the past, deal with what is reality today, and think forward into that vision that nobody else sees. So a personal vision, really. Um, how does, sorry, how much does the higher than average price of your clothing actually separate Donna Karen clothing from society rather than allow it to be part of, or does it matter? Are we talking luxury, the form of luxury price points? Is that what we're discussing? I, I guess it's insinuating that. I have to tell you, um, I'm a fabric addict. If anybody would say I'm a drug addict, I'm a drinking addict, I'm a fabric nut, you know? And I celebrate what goes into fabric. 
you know, and what goes into the creativity and the technology and all of that. You know, when I see something being sewn and the, the way a garment is made, I think in a, in a Donna Cameron or in a luxury product, there is so much soul that is put into that. And that is the luxury that you're having. You're dealing on so many levels. When you touch it, when it touches you, you know, when that cashmere piece and you wrap yourself around for the rest of your life and, you know, and it feels so good against your body and you can afford that feeling of luxury, you know, when you put it on, you know the difference. And that I'm not being a snob about it. It's the way a shoe gets made and it forms the foot, you know, and when a garment gets made and forms the body, um, the way a fabric gets designed and gets developed. And it's, it's sort of like a developmental stage. And then it works its way down to the mass. But at top of creativity and creation is that artist. It's like that special painting, you know, that, that creative process of developing that yarn that is so unique. You know, I've had the honor of working some of the best artisans in fabrics. And that's a gift. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful gift and that's a luxury. You know, and it, it, it's really unique. So, and it's, it's limited. It's not for everybody. You know, it's for a, a group of people who can definitively afford it. And I find that with a lot of luxury clothes, and I can speak for mine, I can speak for Ralph's probably, you don't throw them away they do have a long, a lasting appeal, you know, that does have that, that continuum. People come into me all the time and go, oh my God, I got that from you when, you know, 12 years ago and I'm still wearing it. You know, sometimes they say, why do, ago. Why, 20 why, years ago, why do I design anymore? <laughs> I love it. You know, if there's longevity to a garment, God bless you, which fabric is this? <laughs> I probably, yeah. <laughs> you see, and it stretches. I mean, that really is that technology and that uniqueness that that yarn is worth a tremendous amount of money, you know, and it does last. So I hope that answers luxury. Yeah. And I think this is an interesting one, but I would like to just add to it. The question is, do you have any plans to go green in the future? However, I think, and it comes from a student, but I think wonder if it's more about us understanding what maybe green is and is there a misunderstanding I, around that word and the philosophy? I am most interested in, in celebrating, exploring, and I think the conditions that we live in today have to be acknowledged. You know, I don't think you can build a house without the consciousness of how to preserve energy. You know, would I go to fluorescent lighting? Probably not. I'm allergic to it. I mean, desperately allergic to fluorescent lights. And I don't know how to deal with it. You know, it just, it zaps your energy. So you want to know where your relationship between the energy and the energy comes from. I would like to see everything in candlelight. You know, and I'll be very happy about the lighting here. We'll discuss it another time. But <laughs> light is very, very important. Um, I do, I think the sensitivity of hand and touch and organicness, there's a lot of work that has to be done. I work with bamboo and I adore it. You know, I love bamboo houses. I love the development of bamboo. You know, is it either or exclu exclusivity? You know, I think we're in a developmental stage, definitely. I celebrate it. I want to learn more about it. I want to work more on it, you know. Um, you know, getting back to the earth is so important. There's no question about it. And how this relationship between myself and the fabric people, because I'm so fabric sensitive, and, you know, I think it's hard to talk about black, you know, and, and work that way organically. So it's, it's, a, it's a learning curve. And I, I will continue to celebrate it. And I look to it. One of the things that I do at Urban Zen right now is a lot of recycling. So I take my clothes and I recycle them, which I adore doing. I print on them. I recycle them. I work with them. I work with the craft. So um, a lot of the t-shirts that I do right now are all in bamboo for um, my patient advocacy program. 
So I engage in it 100%, and I look to have many more years of engaging and learning. So that's probably one of the exciting parts of exploring and never-ending education. Interesting one. You have stores in Turkey. Do you think women in Turkey and in the States dress differently? If so, why and how? Now, that's a loaded question for me because I have to live in two worlds. And it's really, it's, it's kind of funny. That's almost what propelled me to Urban Zen. Because uh, I went to Turkey and I had a store in Turkey and I went there and I go, I'm in Turkey looking for the culture of Turkey. And then I bombed onto DKNY. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> there I was right around the corner. You go to Madison Avenue, you go to London, you go to Paris. And where is the cultural preservations? Where's the, the preservation of each and every culture? I think, you know, when I look at um, how we are developing, you know, throughout the world and the challenge of preserving the culture, like in China, is such a fine line. And I think it's going to open up enormously to where we want to go back to our roots and go back to and celebrate the roots of each and every country. Yet how do we work with them culturally to develop a relationship that is not, you know, saying, we've moved in, this is who we are. You know, when I go to Africa, which I, I do a lot of traveling there, you know, it fascinates me to see how fast they're changing. You see everybody in the sarong and with the Motorola. And can I um, email you? I go, I don't even email and you're emailing me. You know, and this is in the middle of nowhere on the Maasai. So uh, what's happening today is moving at such warp speeds. What I celebrate personally, and I pray that we can celebrate the cultures in every country and help support and um, our American Indians, the people of Haiti, you know, the people of, of China and Tibet and India and Turkey, you know, and to be able to preserve their culture and not have this globalization that there's all one, but to keep our uniqueness and keep our individuality. Um, sorry, do you think there will be a lasting effect on the industry from this economic disaster? And how will this affect developing designers, buyers, etc.? Pardon me? Um, do you think there will be a lasting effect on the industry from the economic disaster? And will this affect, how will this affect developing designers, buyers? I think it's going to be a huge effect. You know, I think the call to, um, the call to action is it's just not the way it was. So we're being called upon on every single level, you know, to be able to, to climb to higher, the standards of, are raising very high. You know, what really is our reason or our purpose for being? You know, what are the challenges that we're faced with? How can we truly make a difference out in the world? How can we collaborate and get beyond our ego of the I? You know, is it a group of designers now? Is it a team? Is it another way of developing? You know, and I think, I keep on thinking of the ego as the one thing that might be obliterated, <laughs> respectively speaking, and thinking about cause and how we can collaborate with one another to build an entity of a new form of creativity. Okay. Um, would you ever do a plus size clothing for women? Who? A plus size. A, a, Absolutely. A I do a plus size every day of my life. <laughs> I'm constantly in plus sizes. <laughs> I don't believe in sizing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, again, I think that formula of plus sizing is, is, is old fashioned. You know, I think there were, okay, the other day, um, Precious, has everybody seen Precious? Of course you have. It was the most brilliant movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Um, I was honored to do a photo shoot with her, and she was wearing Urban Zen. And I just love the fact that we could be wearing the exact same dress, you know, and that was beautiful. And I love the fact that, you know, whatever the body type is, the flexibility of fashion and what is a fabric. You know, I mean, there's no size in what I'm wearing. 
you know, my daughter wears it, I wear it, we all wear it, you know, it's like one size fits all, take a piece of fabric, wrap it around, and God bless it. So I think just plus sizes has to be looked at differently. Yeah. Which is actually an interesting one, where a very straightforward question. What is your favorite piece? My favorite who? Your favorite piece of clothing. At the moment? Yeah, I guess, yeah. My beads and my belt bag. These are from uh, Senegal. There are beads that were made with an artist in hand. I almost see them as my prayer beads. Um, I practically wear them every single day. I can't take them off. You know, and I, you, you get these attachments. Uh, my belt bags, I don't have to think. I think belt bags are where it's at, guys, in the accessory industry. Nobody listens to me, but you can wear your bag, you can wear your phone. I don't know how you carry around bags. I think belt bags are where it's at. Uh, <laughs> You know, nobody else picked it up but me, but <laughs> it's okay. You know, we walk around with backpacks. We need our hands free, so, and a scarf. You know, I mean, life, I have to, I'm sorry, that's the most important thing in the world is a blanket scarf, you know. Cozy, travel, wrap it up, wear it out at night, you know, cover yourself up, use it for everything you need. There is nothing more important than a piece of fabric. Basta. Well, I think um, the questions I have, you've really, really covered. So I think really, um, if anything, we can thank Donna Karen thank you. and Valerie Steele for this thank you. really thank interesting you. conversation. Oh, it's